Hi, everyone. My name is Leanne Tran. I'm a professor here at the University of Miami um, in the School of Communication, and my focus is in interaction design and humanitarian design. So hopefully that will be my entry here um, as we talk about agriculture. And um, I welcome all of you. Hopefully you're taking a nice break from the cold if you're from up north where I'm from um, and enjoying the weather here in Miami. So welcome. Um, I'd like to start off by announcing, or actually inviting to the stage this year's honored commitments. Um, we'll start with Solvia Solar. Uh, the team is made up of uh, Miranda Prentice, uh, Taylor Scott, and Emily Eggers from the University of Colorado at Boulder. All right. According to the United States Central Intelligence Agency, nearly one third of all workers in Nicaragua are employed in the agricultural sector. Most of them farm small plots of land and rely on expensive diesel generators to power surface irrigation systems that are ineffective, labor intensive, and expensive. But with Nicaragua's strong equatorial sunlight and the government's commitment to deriving 90% of all energy from renewable sources in 2020, by 2020, there exists great potential to make agriculture cleaner and cheaper through the use of new solar concentration technologies. Miranda, Taylor, and Emily have committed to making farming easier and more profitable for smallholder farmers in Nicaragua by designing an affordable solar-powered drip irrigation system that uses less water and less manpower than conventional systems. The group has developed a working prototype which relies on a gravity-assisted solar-driven pump to power an efficient drip irrigation system that will reduce labor and fuel costs and help farmers increase profits by about 30%. The system will sell for between $1,500 and $3,000 and will be cheaper than other systems currently on the market. It is expected to pay for itself within the first two to three years and last for another 10 to 12 years beyond that. The team plans to launch the system in time for the start of the growing season this August and hopes to reach farmers in all regions of the country by 2017. Through their design, the team hopes to help farmers maximize their incomes, break cycles of poverty, and enjoy more prosperous features. Thank you, Team Sylvia Solar. All right. Um, um, and our second honored. Oh, yes. Oh, I'm sorry. That's right. Are they the same? Okay. Thank you. And for our second honored commitment, I'd like to invite to the stage Cloud Storage of Farm Activities, Kosos Bor Borlos, and Manos Kantakis of ATEI Crete. So, according to a 2014 European Commission report, 12% of the Greek workforce is employed in the agricultural sector. Most farmers work small plots of land, totaling less than five acres, and in the decade between 2002 and 2012, organic farming in Greece increased more than 400%. However, most Greek farmers lack the tools to manage the extensive record keeping required by the EU to certify their compliance with organic standards. Without accurate documentation, these farmers put both their certifications and valuable income at risk. Using voice recognition software and a cloud-based database, Costa and Mano have committed to developing a convenient, easy-to-use mobile application that will revolutionize the way Greek farmers collect and record data required for the various EU certifications. By responding to voice prompts, farmers will be able to enter date, time, and quantity of fertilizer or pesticides available, applied. Um, the software will track the usage of each input and alert the farmer if he or she is in danger of exceeding the legal limits for his certification. This app will generate daily reports and digital records that will be available on the cloud, allowing farmers to quickly generate forms required by the EU and making farm work more efficient and more compliant with modern farming standards. Costa Amano plan to beta test this application with 20 Greek farmers over the next year and a half and hope to reach many more after that. Great.
So I'd like to now um, start the panel discussion and first introduce our panelists. Uh, first, we have Timote Georges, co-founder of Smallholder Farmers Alliance. Uh, Loretta Mayer, Chief Scientific Officer and Chairman of the Board for Sen Senis Tech, Inc. And Ryan Jensen, CEO of Honeycomb. All right, so I'll first do a quick um, remark and then I'll come and join the panelists. Um, so about two million people, about half of the world's workforce, live on or manage the world's 450 million small farms. Our global, like, our global um, livelihood depends on the food and other vital resources from these farms, and yet these smallholder farmers are extremely vulnerable and face overwhelming challenges, such as water scarcity, rising costs of agriculture, and lack of access to, as well as unfamiliarity with some of the new technologies that are emerging. Our Go 2.0 panel um, of inspiring speakers and leaders will address common challenges, lessons learned, and crucial considerations to advance small-scale farming. All right, so I'll come join the panelists right now. Can you guys hear me? Oh, okay, great. Um, So I think for um, looking at all of your work, there's a common thread that is shared, which is that it's not just about addressing directly the problem that you, that you may see on hand, which would be maybe um, overpopulation of rodents um, or you know, just addressing the water management itself, but looking at them as greater systems and, and measures that um, would need to be targeted in the long term in order to have greater and more sustainable growth in agriculture. So for me, for each of you, we can start with, um, with Loretta um, to explain how you've tried to address beyond just uh, rodent control in the short term, but the long term and the sustainable practices that you've implemented. Sure, and thank you. It is just an absolute treat to be here with all of you. Um, what we've done is we've actually looked at the pain that small-scale farmers have, and that is that somewhere between 20 and 30 percent of what they grow never reaches the table due to rodent damage. And our activities in the past have been to kill rodents. Now, our colleagues in Australia uh, and in, uh, in the Philippines have shown us that this is not a sustainable way to manage. Clearly, uh, we've been killing these rodents for centuries, and we still have rodents, and we still have damage. But the real sustainable solution is to manage their fertility, because rodents are territorial. So the idea is you manage their fertility so that if you have rodents on your farm and you have reduced yours, your rodents are not going to come over to this farm. And it's just that simple. If you kill all the rodents, you've created a banquet here, right? And so all of your rodents, as smart as they are, are going to come over here and then they're going to reproduce. The problem is not the rat. The problem is reproduction. And so that's the strategy we've used. And the other part of the strategy is you've got to get poison out of our environments. In Laos, where we work, in these rice fields, they co-culture. They have ducks in the ponds along the field. We cannot allow poison into that environment. So when you think about the small-scale farmer, for example, the farmer in Indonesia, he plants 10 rows of rice. He plants six rows to feed his family. He plants two rows to sell. And he plants two rows for the rats. And they will tell you that this is a part of their culture. We need to kind of think outside the bubble. We can grow all kinds of GMO-type uh, rat rice plants 
that resist drought and other insects, but we've never been able to produce something that a rat won't eat. Because if a rat won't eat it, you won't eat it. And so it's dedicating ourselves, which is what I'm hearing from all of you out there in your commitments, it's putting yourself into that position of the small scale farmer and seeing what can we effectively do? What can they afford to do? What is effective? and what works. Well, let's just keep more of what they grow. And I, I hope that kind of addresses your, your question and what right. you're looking for. Right, and I think uh, what I've seen with Senes Tech is that you know, it's not just you know, controlling the short-term problem, but it's the long-term reproduction and you know, the, the, magnif uh, the multiplier effect right, of reproduction of the rodents. That is also a problem. So it's more large scale than just the immediate effect of Exactly. We're in it for the long haul, just like the rat. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. All right, great. Uh, so um, for Timote, so in, he in Haiti, you've been um, dealing with agroforestry, so both contributing to um, providing food for the local community as well as planting trees to make it a more sustainable place. Um, so can you talk about some of the practices that you've enabled with your organization? Thank you, Lion, and thank you for everybody to have me here. We are Smallholder Farmers Alliance. We are not a network of 2,000 small-scale farmers in Haiti. We see small-scale farmers as people who are suffering from hunger, malnutrition. They are about 1, million, 1 billion worldwide, and 25,000 of them are dying every day because of malnutrition and hunger. And when we think of this category of people, we don't see them as a, a possible beneficiaries of any project, but we see them as some possible agents of change. As a foundation of small-scale farmers, we, at the very beginning, engage these people. We make them part of their decision-making. And we go to this field, uh, listen to them, observe, and talk to them, and skills them trying to build our local capacity development. And that way, we do, we do not own the project, but they are the owners of what we're doing. And our practice is basically on agroforestry. We work with them for a limited time, amount of time. That could be three or four, four years, depends on the ability of the people to take over. At the end of this period, we do a transition from our leadership to the community leadership. And we also create a local business that's called local social business. And the profit is to refuel the same projects and make them um, continue for life. And we take these people out of funding. So right now, at the moment I'm talking, we are in the process of transiting our project to the community of Gonaives and Haiti. So that's uh, one aspect of our practices and the way we achieve sustainability. Excellent. So it's great to hear that you've been building capacity and also doing knowledge transfer to the local community, right? So it's not just about the organization coming in, but also being able to you know, train them and get them up to speed so that they can be self-sufficient, which I think, you know, your organization has done in a few years, has been able to, you know, fund um, all the work that you do and become more sustainable over the long term. Yes. As I talked to Dr. Loretta about what she's doing, she said she's trying to help them with post-harvest technologies as well, which is in Haiti, they are not yet there. They don't have this problem. They actually have the problem to start. They don't have the problem to, store, to stock the product. But the problem is find a way to make 
um, useful the small plot of land. And this is what, where we are working with them. Great, thank you. Uh, so talking about you know being able to get started. Um, so with Ryan, you're doing some pretty cool stuff with technology and drones and and mapping, imaging. So can you share a little bit what you guys are doing and how that might help um, these small scale farmers to become also more resilient and sustainable in the long term? Yep, absolutely. So uh, as you mentioned, uh, what we do is we actually at uh, Honeycomb we produce drones and we do the uh, mapping and then imaging and so forth, uh, so that uh, the uh, the person or the individual or whoever it may be. Uh, can actually cover more area. And so it's kind of geared initially towards, uh, you know, larger operations uh, so that you're more efficient with your people, with your time, with being able to gather information. And really kind of the idea that uh, I, I want to focus on more is, you know, we're in aerial robotics. We have these flying devices that go out and they get information. Um, and they get the information from the sky and can cover hundreds of acres. They can cover lots of area. But the, the coherent idea is really information. And that's what you know, uh, you know, everyone can benefit from is how do we get information that is able to drive actual decisions that actually have an impact. And so we're kind of in this era overall, and I'm actually a technology guy by trade, so I, I kind of look at everything from that uh, lens. And it's not really about the drones, it's not really about the robots, it's about w what type of information do we need to get and then what do we do about it. And so we're in this world now, and all of you, you know, uh, um, I guess millennials, I guess would be what it is, but. Uh, this year, you'll be the actual largest generation. You'll surpass the baby boomers, right? And so we're in this different world where things are connected. You have information flowing everywhere. You can communicate. And so I kind of look at you know helping the small scale farm or even you know everyone around the world more in the lens of we can communicate with anybody now. We can actually transfer information and know how uh, to anybody. Um, and you know it's going to get better in, in, in the uh, more impoverished uh, uh, states, but it's coming. And this is where the ability to um, use devices or sensors or whatever the case may be to gather information and process it, it's going to become more and more available to everyone. And so that's really more what Honeycomb is about, is actually the information, getting that information, communicating that information, and then doing something about it. And I think what you're going to see is that be diffused all over the world in the coming decade. And I think, you know, when we're talking about small scale farmer here, there's going to be this kind of paradigm shift because the accessibility of technology to everyone is coming, and that actually unlocks some pretty key um, uh, capabilities that uh, um, uh, are transformative. So I, I, I guess that's the lens that I look at things, uh, less about the drones, more about the information and how that impacts people. Excellent, right. So it's all about the information, um, but it's also, there may be their barriers to getting the information and understanding the information. So for all of you, what are some, some of those barriers that you've had to uh, face and then how are we able to overcome them and and especially for you know um, for you Ryan how how has it been trying to disseminate the information to get people to actually understand what it, the metrics mean and how they, what kind of things they need to change as a result of the information yeah so it's it's actually been you know quite a bit of work because whenever you're on the leading edge you got to educate people you got to educate yourselves actually you got to figure out you know where the market is and, and, and what the uh, niche is and so forth and we were talking a little bit about rodents actually has applications there but the the idea is you know with the internet i can transfer this information this is what we do you can transfer it to the cloud and we can do this high performance compute and so this 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 aspect of you know not directly tied to agriculture but tied to internet that pr creates this pipeline where you can actually transfer that information to people or computers or thousands of computers to actually do the processing and get you that information. And so it's a little bit artificial intelligence like, it's a little big data type, but again, those technology pipelines and that infrastructure are very, very transformative in the, in the way that we can actually have people interpret those, have machines interpret that, and that information can flow and can communicate in a seamless manner. So I don't, hopefully that answers the question, but that's again how I see the world. And so Loretta, do you want to share one of your barriers to maybe entry and how you've been able to overcome it? Well, and I, I don't think that the pythons of the rice fields of Indonesia were barriers, um, but they definitely were a deterrent. Um, for us, in dealing with the small scale farmer, and, and I, I'm really talking about the one and a half to two hectare farms, um, in each of the different regions that we work, it's understanding the culture. Um, for example, in the projects we do in Laos, um, understanding how the farmers feel about the rodents. These rodents are, 
are decimating their crops in the fields. However, in the evening, when we walk down the streets of Vientiane on the Mekong Delta, they're barbecued on sticks. And so they go from being a pest to being a food source. Now, you really have to understand their culture to help address this problem. And so I think for us, until we were able to engage folks directly from the area, from the region, people who live there, uh, we stumbled quite a bit. Excellent. Yeah, so I would like um, Timote to answer the question, but also to talk about you know, how you engage with the community, addressing local culture, attitudes, beliefs, and how that has shaped um, the outcomes of your organization. Yeah, the way we engage the people, we actually uh, try to understand uh, their mindset, uh, the local challenges, the feeling about realities. Um, there's no way to better understand the situation without uh, um, talking to them and trying to understand that. So we invite them to the discussion table. And they actually uh, align different needs they have. What we do, we try to, to pick out what is worth it to do. Because there, there will always need, but there's something worth it to do. And we, had, we help them identify what should be done technically. That will be the top priority and the problem that is the priority for the community. So sometimes people come into the communities, they bring hat, but people need shoes. Or they bring shoes, people need pants. <laughs> so that happens because there is no dialogue, no exchange with the communities. So the first thing we do is to understand them, talk to them, and then after we identify uh, the problems and we propose solutions. And as part of the solution solving process, the people are at the center of everything. And we do not pay them to do anything. So money cannot be the, the incentive to get people on, on board for long-term results. Uh, in Haiti, some NGOs uh, use cash for work. They give people maybe 200 goods a day to do some work. But how long you can keep paying people uh, to do work? You cannot do that for life. But if you uh, um, empower people, if you skill them, they will be an agent of change for life. And this is exactly what we do. And we work with them and at a certain point, we, we, we set back and we let them in the front to take the initiative and continue with what we have been doing. Excellent. Right, so I think what we're hearing here is that you know, community is all about being part of the solution and engaging them and making them feel like they're part of the change and not just providing tools and resources that they haven't maybe they don't have, they need to have the buy-in into those new solutions, right? And um, potentially, you know, going beyond just being flexible on your part, right? To maybe adapt to their needs and um, preferences as well. Um, so, great. So, f one thing we should, I'd like to talk about is, you know, the issue of f food security, which is obviously a global issue. Um, and I think in, throughout the world, even in, um, whether it's developing world or developed world, um, there may there's this priority to, well, having limited amount of time and then trying to devote it directly to um, the generation of food or providing for your family. And I think sometimes we don't think about the more like holistic, uh, larger systemic reasons um, that can contribute to food scarcity and also um, food access. So for all of you, can you um, talk about what are some of the factors that we uh, that populations in general, maybe you want to talk about specific communities or uh, just general um, recommendations for people who are trying to combat, f combat food scarcity and again, becoming more sustainable 
um, in their agricultural practices, and also you know how we can use technology potentially to um, to fight the, the the food scarcity problem. So I open it up to to all panelists who would love like to jump in. Yeah, uh, unfortunately, I don't see technology as the first thing to do into the community to help people, because technology always needs some basic infrastructure to start. And these infrastructures do not exist in some communities. So we, with the problem of food insecurity, we should see people as uh, food providers, helping them to make food uh, locally, because this problem is not here because of lack of food. But I think it's mostly because of uh, access to, f to food. Not all these people I mentioned before, this one billion people can access food, even if the food might be available. So the right way to deal with that is to make the food available locally, help them produce themselves. And what's an example of how you've been able to do that in Haiti? Giving them, granting greater access to the food? Um, access to food, it's not a local challenge in Haiti. It could be a, a local challenge because, because they don't have, have uh, money to purchase it. But also, if we're looking at some high technology, industrial ag um, agriculture, um, looking at biofuels, using food for biofuels or other stuff like that. So these people in the poor countries, even if the, the, the industrialized country, countries have enough food, but that does not mean that this food is available in the poor countries. So it's a global problem, not just Haiti. Oh, it's definitely a problem. I was just supposed to, if you had a, a specific example about how um, how you've been able to provide greater access. We do reforestation, and as a way for the people to benefit, uh, I mean, to to benefit our uh, support. They come to our tree nurseries to work. And in our turn, we go to their field, we give them seeds, better quality seeds, we give them training, and uh, we give them some agricultural tools. So, with that, within 90 days, I have a lot of examples in some communities in Haiti where within just three months, we have food available locally. And that can be beans or corn or some other vegetable squad. Excellent. And Loretta, do you want to share some um, recommendations for small-scale farmers who are trying to address food scarcity in their... I agree with, with Timote. And I think that when you're thinking about food security, you have to understand what food security really means. What it means is the amount of time that you invest in feeding yourself and your family. So if you understand that as a sliding scale, and if you reduce the amount of time that you have to invest in that, then you're going to increase the amount of time that you have for education, for social issues, and this can tremendously change the complexion of your community. And the solutions aren't always high technology. The solutions, especially in agriculture, when it comes to you know, rodent and pestilence loss, is something as simple as synchrony of planting. If you plant your farm at the same time you plant and you plant, then you have equalized the amount of food that is available for rodents in their destruction. But if you plant, and then you plant, and then you plant, they're just going to move from farm to farm to farm. This idea 
of synchronizing. This comes from community action. Uh, this is something that the International Race Research Institute in Los Banos has been doing for years, working with the community. That's not a high-tech solution. That's a very low-tech solution in working with the communities. But food security has to be something that is valued. To spend less time providing food for yourself will allow you time for other things that will build your community and your individuals. Great, so it's about efficiency, right? <laughs> food security but gang in the back must be the Ramsey Foundation. <laughs> Excellent, and then Ryan. Uh, yeah, I, I guess I'd just add a few things um, in the sense too, uh, looking at food security kind of uh, in, a, in a variety of ways, or at least two different uh, ends of the spectrum, I suppose. So kind of from my perspective with uh, information and precision technology and so forth, it's kind of the idea of uh, being more efficient, increasing yield and so forth. But also, you know, there's the back end uh, story, which is, you know, things as simple as uh, refrigeration, for example, or food loss for, for other reasons. And so the kind of the lens that I look at it through is uh, the front end and the back end. How can we, uh, you know, uh, create more, uh, produce more with less work and become more efficient about it? And then how can we preserve that or keep that, uh, you know, uh, access uh, through other technologies of, you know, maintaining it, preserving it in some way. And in a lot of these countries, you know, that's, that's a big issue where a lot of food is just lost. Um, when you have tons produced, it's, it's lost on the back end. And so kind of those two things put together, uh, you know, um, kind of create the picture at least on the front end and the back end. And then, of course, in the middle, there's all the things, too, to, uh, um, uh, to do as well with people and processes and so forth. So. And if I could just tag on to a moment, and Ryan, you're really going into what I think Timote was saying, which is then distribution. So if we can grow it and we have it, we need to be able to distribute it and get it to everyone who needs it. Great. Um, so with any initiative, it's really, it's about, a really important part is being able to measure your impact or to be able to report on specific practices that you're doing that are making positive change. So could you want to speak to, again, open to the panel, um, an example of how you do measure your impact and the change that it's had in short term and lo or long term? OK. <laughs> um, our impact in, uh, and I'll just, I'll just take uh, Indonesia. If we reduce the fertility by 50%, in other words, if 50% of the rats are sterilized in a, in a rice field, we'll reduce the damage by 80%. And so what that converts to, and, and this is something that the president of Indonesia is very committed to, and that is a 5% reduction and their loss will feed 380 million people. And we're able to do that because it is sustainable. And uh, the same thing with protein production facilities. We're reducing those populations by 70% in a sustainable and humane manner that doesn't poison or harm the environment. But that's what you want to look at when you're measuring your, your results. It's how much food is available at the end of the day and what was the cost-benefit analysis, which is the value proposition that we're all looking for. Yeah, and I guess I would say that, uh, you know, with, with uh, components of information, it can be difficult sometimes to directly measure, you know, what the impact is. But fortunately, you know, we've been able to measure with uh, metrics of reducing crop loss or in increases in efficiency from a, uh, a management so, uh, sort of uh, perspective where how, mu how many resources are taken to do this now, how many could be taken to, uh, to do this in this uh, different way using robotics. And so that's kind of the, uh, the uh, near-term kind of look at things. But obviously, at the end of the day, it's what does the productivity look like and what was the cost of doing that? And that's, uh, again, just a cost-benefit analysis and being able to look at that honestly and saying, you know, how can we do this better? How can we make this better? And what are the results? It just really comes down to, you know, kind of tracking that. But then sometimes it's also less direct. It's, you know, did this, uh, did this information change how someone manages and they've changed how they do it year over year and they've just kind of learned it because, you know, people will actually learn and then implement and, you know, there's this feedback loop that's not always quantitative or easy to measure. Um, and that happens all over. And so those are a little bit more difficult. But again, at the end of the day, it's, you know, production, 
efficiency and uh, the uh, cost associated with that. Well, Smallholder Farmers Alliance, uh, before we start anything on the ground, we said we will try to increase the productivity of some specific crop. That was um, that were corn, sorghum, and black beans. So from 2010 to 2013, we were along the road to get this achieved. At the moment I'm talking, we do that. We increase the productivity of this crop for this community in Gonaives area. And um, our impact is also on the people as agents of change. We actually grad graduate in around 50 small-scale farmers. Now they are ready to be extensionist agents. There are those who will be teaching other farmers. Excellent. All right, well, thank you. Um, so that concludes the panel portion of the session, and we'll open it now to Q&A. So raise your hand and someone will come around with a mic and you can ask to the general panel or to a specific panelist. Um, start over here. Maybe make our way across. Thank you for um, your time and insight. It was a really great experience, so thank you all. Um, my question is about um, climate change and smallholder farmers. And there's expert consensus about climate change, and many of these experts predict that due to the nature of agriculture, how rural communities are often marginalized, um, that uh, smallholder farmers will be some of the most impacted by the effects of climate change. And my question is, what do you see as the most effective adaptation strategies that smallholder farmers can use um, to become more resilient against the effects of climate change? Thank you. This should be an, adapt an adaptive measure because uh, it's an inconvenient truth. Um, and many aspects, climate change does affect small scale farming. But in order to deal with that, we need adaptive measures, like uh, using some mitigation um, uh, uh, strategies, using the multifunctionality of agriculture to deal with climate destabilization. Like, for example, not doing um, monoculture, uh, using um, um, some agroforestry technologies that are climate uh, adaptive measures to work with the people. Um, I think that's uh, a few things you can uh, do when thinking about uh, small scale, scale farming in, in uh, such a vulnerable climate. I think uh, we need to get out ahead of that curve. And um, I'll just give you an example. In Australia, they have mouse plagues. And these mouse plagues used to occur every seven years. And the plagues were so severe that wheat farmers would not plant wheat because the loss of the seed alone cost them more than to leave their fields fallow. Those plagues then were occurring every four years. Now, our friends in Australia are dealing with mouth plagues that are every 30 months. So this is a factor of drought. It's a factor of water. And what we have to do is get ahead of that, address that issue before those animals plague. And I think that We've got, we've got the technology, and if we can get the information managed, and, and in Australia, they're using cell phones. If you see a mouse in April, you just hit your cell phone, it has a GPS locator, goes straight to the Invasive Animal Control Center, and they're able now to predict where those plagues are gonna hit. This is the type of thing we have to do. Thank you. Yeah, and I guess I just kind of echo that as well. I mean, with with climate change, it's not always known exactly what the, you know, what what the outcome is. What what's the result? Is it these plagues that happen more frequently? But uh, you know, again, to kind of uh, uh, 
echo that uh, information story is being able to track what's going on and being able to see that information. And uh, when you're able to see it, you have the chance of adapting to, to whatever's coming. And I think the adaptive metric too is, is very important because uh, that's what you have to do. That's, what's, that's what it kind of entails, right? Is being able to change and how do we do it? You need information to be able to make those decisions. Um, lady, yes, in the black and white top. Hi, my name is Rhea Gasway, and I'm from Iowa State University. Um, my question has to do with, you said over time, um, rats were sterilized. Did they um, adapt over time, like the corn borer, for example? Their eggs planted um, every, propped up every year, and then they um, kind of formed to pop up every two years. And so what do you do about that? Great question. No, they don't adapt. Reproductive strategy in mammals is very different. And um, although rats are the most successful species on Earth, well, no, I take it back. I think cockroaches are. But they do not adapt because reproduction is so highly conserved across all mammalian species. Does that answer your question and make sense to you? OK. Classes, um, the lady in the front. Sorry. Good afternoon. My name is Orquidea Lopez, and I am studying business management and entrepreneurship. Um, my question it is about um, what are two big challenges that you have found when implementing implementing projects in the agro industry? And I am interested in that question because I'm going to implement a commitment to action that it is focused on empowering women from rural areas through the agro business. Two big challenges that you have found when implementing projects. Oh, I can't help myself. <laughs> One of the largest challenges is childcare. And that is how do women in agriculture settings balance the care of children in villages? So there are women who go into the fields, and I will say primarily, um, I'm talking about Southeast Asia. And then there are women who, must, who stay and take care of the children. Now, if we can provide more time, then there can be more time available for children and more children, and I would say girls, to go to school. So I think that's the first big challenge that I've seen. Any other challenges? No. You want a second challenge? You're pushy. <laughs> <laughs> I would say the second challenge that I've seen has been economic. Um, and again, it comes back to education. Uh, women, uh, I, I work with uh, a, young, a young woman in Laos. Uh, Nunang, and um, she had to stop her education relative to the agriculture work that we were doing because she had to care for her family. Had she been able to continue, such as Dr. Naomi Tue, who we were able to get through a PhD program, she's now the rodentologist for Myanmar, if we can get that education for these women, get them in positions where they can use their ability to increase the knowledge in the agriculture space, we're much better served. Is that enough? Good. Uh, my name is Trent Zerman from Loyola Marymount University. Uh, you talked a lot about food production and access. Uh, what are ways that we as consumers can ethically buy the products we consume? Oh, I can't do all the talking. What, could you expand a little on ethically buy the products we consume? Uh, well, using the example of uh, coffee and chocolate, for example, there's fair trade and direct trade processes of buying coffee uh, to make sure farmers get more of the money uh, from the product. Are there, what ways do you see uh, in other products that we can buy ethically, say for uh, water conservation, uh, money going to the right people, 
and so on and so forth. I say information, and you probably hold it in your hand. These used to be smartphones. They're really computers with a phone app. I think the more that you educate yourself to understand, for example, if you're buying a product, what corporation is it coming from, what producer, uh, how much water has been consumed, what's the carbon footprint for the production of that food, then you need to make your choices with your purchases as a consumer, but information. I'm not recalling any applications, the names of them, but they're definitely sites where they um, do give grades to certain brands and products, and also there's like carbon footprint calculators and things like that. So that's just one way to at least quantify and feel a little bit better about it, but it is more in-depth education, I think, and hopefully sharing that knowledge with your friends and your family and, and getting people more aware of that, because I think Maybe in this room we're very knowledgeable, but there are people who are just not really aware of the differences between fair trade and you know, a regular um, everyday brand. How about over here? Uh, yes, one lady here. Hi, my name is Emma Middleton, and I'm from the University of St. Andrews. Um, how did you go about beginning to implement these projects in communities? How did you go about talking to communities about what you were trying to do and getting them on board with your plans. I'll, I guess I'll start there. Uh, again, kind of a little different take, but uh, what I've noticed is you have to kind of be in the field. You gotta get your feet dirty, literally. Um, and you just have to be out there and figure out what the market looks like, what people are saying, what they actually need, um, what their concerns are, what their culture is, you know, how they operate, what, you know, all of those things are very, very important because you can come at uh, something with your kind of your own mindset and thinking that you know the solution or you know that uh, we just need to kill all the rodents, right? That's that's the problem. Don't kill them. Don't kill them, Ryan. <laughs> Do not kill them. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, it turns out you know that, uh, that that's not that's not the full story. And so, getting the full story, I think, is is something you know just in in business and overall is very important in understanding the people because at the end of the day, everything is about people. I mean, that's what it comes down to and understanding them, and you just use technology and other things uh, to kind of, uh, I kind of look at it as technology is a way of kind of wrestling the nature and the world into submission by people in a way, right? And, it, and you, you just use the processes, you put things on top of it, but at the end of the day, again, it's about the people and what their needs are and understanding them. I think that's very important. Yeah, definitely, um, just to understand the, the general culture and how people do uh, communicate, because sometimes it's not, what, not so much what they're saying, but they're, what they're not saying, and understanding the context in which they're, you know, the way you're framing it or the type of question they're asking or the type of answer they don't want to give, right? So just to be really culturally cognizant, I think is really important. Um, gentleman in the purple shirt. Uh, hi, I'm Chris. I'm from the University of Edinburgh. Um, the title of this discussion is Advancing the Small Scale Farmer. But in countries like the US and England, where I'm from, the trend has been towards sort of large scale, industrial, efficient, and more reliable uh, farming. Do you think that small scale agriculture is compatible with food security and food scarcity, or do you think maybe a transition to large scale agriculture might be more effective? I mean, I think large scale is just going to happen. I mean, obviously, it's happened. Um, I think there's a balance between both, of course, and, you, and I think you can, uh, uh, you can do small scale in, in conjunction with large scale, but I, I do know what you mean, and it is occurring, and part of the, uh, I guess, my perspective on that is uh, it's, 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 a, it's an efficiency thing. Um, not necessarily the best in every way, but uh, as you scale and you put together processes and, and, uh, and so forth and amortize costs, I mean, it just gets bigger. But I do think that, you're, that uh, the small scale farmer um, and locally and, and being able to control the, uh, the kind of the uh, sphere that they operate in, I think that's also sustainable as well because it has different logistical trade-offs. I mean, it's, it's local, it it's doesn't need to be transferred, it has some other cost structures that are beneficial from my perspective. I think you're, I think you're right on that. Um, but I do think there is a trend that we need to be, be very mindful of, and that is the trend, some of people call it slow food but it's the idea of going into the communities and more local food production. I'd invite you to look at what's happening in the Hawaiian Islands, where small-scale organic farming, which results in community farmers' markets, 
on, on weekends and more of a, a community involvement is starting to gain a lot of speed because people really want to know what pesticide was used on my lettuce, you know, what's in the, what's in the soil. And so as you get to places where this becomes a higher priority, you are going to see more small scale. You're going to see community gardens, um, things along those. But in the larger scale of things, to grow cost-effective food, there's no question it is still in the larger scale until we change how we think about things. I just want to do a time check um, for Q&A. We're done. OK. So sorry for those of you who have questions. Maybe you can um, find people later to, to ask questions. But um, as a OK, well, are you one minute quick? Sorry, there's so many wonderful questions. I'm sorry I wasn't able to get to you. But we'll if you can, quick. OK. We ha I'm sorry for the time for, for our time sake. We'll have to move on, um, but thank you for all the um, amazing questions. And I would say that you know a big part of this is again engaging communities, making them part of the solution, um, incorporating their getting their buy-in, and um, that it's there is definitely there are technology solutions out there that can help um, improve uh, the food scarcity issue, improve agricultural practices. Um, but it's also not just about the technology, but just enabling people and getting them the resources that they need to even get started because they have the potential and the energy and the interest in it, and they just need to be given the information and some materials and, and that and such as such. Um, so we're going to now move into the um, discussion part of this session. And uh, the panelists and I have come up with a discussion question that I think you could each do at the um, maybe amongst the, uh, yourselves at each table. Um, and Basically, take into consideration everything you've heard here in this panel, work in your small groups, and think about how you would introduce, originally we were saying a new technology, but maybe a new technology or a new farming practice, um, and how you would um, introduce that to small-scale farmers. So think about what is the technology or solution that you'd want to implement, and then kind of outline an implementation plan. And, and with that, think about the, the challenges that you might have to address along the way. Um, so we'll have... I think there's a, are we still, we still have about three, 10 minutes. We'll have 10 minutes for you guys to discuss at your tables, and then uh, we'll have about maybe two or three of you to do a quick presentation of, of your ideas. All right? And we will come around and circulate with the tables as well. And you mentioned afterwards that they're going to report, so OK.
Ladies and gentlemen, there are five minutes remaining. Please repair your report. Hello. All right. So I hear lots of lively discussion, which is wonderful. Um, but it's now time for a few brave souls to come up and share your idea. Hello. Hi, everyone. Sorry. I know we all want to also get to the, the next session. So let's be prompt here. Um, so we have maybe two volunteers who want to share the innovation um, that you want to share, and then um, maybe keep it to about a minute if possible, and we'll start with, with this gentleman over here, and then we'll maybe have another volunteer. How are you guys doing today? My name is Bernie Turry. I'm from the University of Miami. Um, one of the things that our group came up with is a solar microgrid for you know, small-scale farmers. Um, what that does is it decreases the logistics, the logistical cost of transporting fuel, um, to, you know, maybe tractors, uh, farming equipment. Um, but what that really does is it enables, you know, small-scale farmers to develop these farms in areas uh, not connected to the grid, um, decentralized, like the panelists were talking about um, at the, at the uh, previous, um, you know, plenary session. 
um, that uh, solar microgrids, renewable, clean sources of energy can really enable you know, a, a much larger geographic area than a centralized grid. Um, so we figure that if you disconnect um, you know, the, the small scale farm from the, from the centralized grid with like a solar microgrid, we figured that would be a great solution to enable um, a larger area for small scale farms. Awesome, thank you. Um, this young lady in the sweater. Yeah. Hi, my name's Kat and I'm from Cornell University um, and my group has encouraged me to say this. So <laughs> I'm going to respectfully beg to push the panel right at this moment. Um, and I have a question that I'd like you to take into this context. So we've been talking about food security and food security can be defined as availability, access, um, stability, and utilization. And most of this conversation has been on availability even though we've all recognized that availability is not the issue at all. It's those other areas that need to be addressed. Also, I'd like to ask, is it food security or is it food sovereignty? Are we leaving out a huge portion of what it means to be human? So within that context, um, clearly we have a huge flaw of frameworks and of incentive structures in our societies at the national level as well as the international level. And that specifically constrains a small farmer, an NGO, anyone trying to make changes because the incentive structures are totally messed up. Example, you go to Indonesia, you sit down with a farmer who's trying to do organic practices, says he does it for everything except for his watermelon because the government gives him free subsidized fertilizers. So in that kind of a context where you can't do much, you're very resource constrained, how, what are an example of ways that you've been able to make your amazing successes in that framework where you're surrounded by things that are totally limiting the kind of bigger picture that you're going for? I mean, I guess I'd say there's always going to be obstacles, right? But uh, the, you're talking about kind of the framework in which it's kind of structured. So you have kind of all these rules, you have these subsidies or whatever the case may be. And what it really comes down to is the people who came up with those, you know, have the power to do that. But that also changes how people operate. And, you know, it, it's just this whole system, right? It's society. It's, it's, it's government. It's, it's people. It's business. It's all of these things. And... Um, I guess the only way that I, you know, I've kind of seen the, uh, the ability to change that is through people, right? People have to step up and they have to uh, have a voice and they have to lead. And leadership's a huge thing. You know, people, um, if you think about it, the, the best way to kind of have an impact is to be able to lead a bunch of other people, right, with a, with a common goal, with a common vision, and, and have access to resources to do that, of course. But oftentimes, you know, look at the great leaders, you know, of our time, you know, they, they had a voice and they had people who, who responded to that voice and uh, and uh, moved, you know, uh, policy or, ch or changes or whatever the case may be. So it's not an easy answer. It's very, very complex, and all the all the rules that are in place in different ways are very complex. But there are obstacles that can be overcome, and there are obstacles that you know can be brought up as discussion points, and, and leaders can go and they can um, and uh, affect change in those areas. So that's kind of a general way of saying it, but uh, that's kind of my perspective. First of all, the fact that you posed the question is very encouraging to the rest of us. I will tell you, I have done quite a bit of work in the Tibetan refugee camps of northern India, where I had the absolute pleasure to sit with His Holiness, the 14th Dalai Lama. And what he was able to say, and I, I have utmost respect, he is one of the funniest men I've ever met. Um, but Tibetans do not have the best of everything, but they make the best of everything that they have. And so it is a part of the human spirit. And I think as Ryan has said, it's about leadership. This is what we're looking out here in this room for today. And, I, and you're not disappointing any of us, but it has to come from the people, and it doesn't necessarily have to come from people who have the power in their hands today. It can come from a critical mass of people who insist upon a difference. And you have so much power, and you used it today. Thank you. I mean, really, thank you very much. Thank you.
Do you want to do a quick, short answer? <laughs> yep. Uh, we see this problem at the macro and micro level, food sovereignty and food security. Food sovereignty needs some political measurements uh, and agricultural interventions in order to really make food available and accessible to the people. So uh, at the lower level of this, uh, as this achievement is done, you can say people are safe uh, nutritionally. So in my case in Haiti, we do not have yet food sovereignty, and that means no food security as well. So they are linked together. If you don't have uh, updated policies to address the people's problems, you cannot say you have food uh, sovereignty. And this is what we're doing right now, trying to help uh, the related ministries um, come in with some other updated policies and uh, also meet the people and address the situation, working with them and make them uh, uh, part of the thing we want to do with them. So you're right, there are different uh, concepts, but they are correlated. Right. Thank you everyone for joining us today for the panel. And you know, again, we are all, you're all the, the new leaders that will take us into the next generation of farming practices. Um, and you know, I would thank our panelists, Ryan, Loretta, uh, Timote, for joining us and sharing so many illuminating answers. And um, yes, the next session will begin, I think, at 5.30, so I know you'll probably want to rush out. Um, so thank you so much for being here.